Managing Director of SJ Solutions. Seema has been specialising in pharmacovigilance for 20 years and has headed up global pharmacovigilance and medical affairs before setting up SJ Solutions. SJ Solutions services span both consulting and contracting to provide solutions to drug safety, research and other affairs related to the running of a business within the pharmaceuticals industry. Seema has helped companies in implementing the new, new EU legislation and is currently studying for her MSc in epidemiology. Seema, over to you. Hi everybody, thank you very much for, for joining today's webinar. So uh, I know that the previous ones have been more about the regulations and the GPT module, so this time we thought we'd, we'd touch on pharmacoepidemiology because it is important, it is relevant from a pharmacovigilance perspective, certainly from review of an assessment of, of signals, alerts, as well as additional pharmacovigilance activities and, and choosing the right studies and understanding what you're looking at overall in that context. So just to, to start, um, I have made this quite, hopefully, quite simple and straightforward because that's the way that I can understand it too. But when we're looking at um, pharmacopneurological studies, we're looking at an exposure, which is usually a risk factor. And then we look at outcome, which is either a disease or a, a health-related state. And studies can be divided up into descriptive and analytical studies. So descriptive studies are where there's no analysis, statistical analysis as such, but um, there's a description of what is seen, and usually that's the first step in the investigation of a clinical problem. Then you have um, analytical studies, which then follow, usually, descriptive studies. And this is where there is usually a statistical analysis of some kind where you're looking at differences in two groups and, and comparing those differences through an analysis. Now, this diagram, hopefully you can see it, but it just kind of shows you the different types of studies that are uh, available and you can see that it's dependent on whether the exposure is assigned or not. So if the exposure is assigned, it's an interventional study. If it's not assigned, it's an observational study. If you have an interventional study, then you look at random allocation. Has that occurred? Yes or no? If it has, it's a randomized trial. If it hasn't, it's a non-randomized trial. For an observational study, you can look at whether there's comparison group, yes or no. If there isn't, it's a descriptive study, and these are the cohorts of the cross-sectional studies. And if there is, then this is an analytical study, and that can also be a cohort and a cross-sectional study, but also a case control and an ecological study as well. So I think that's just quite helpful just to kind of understand where kind of the distribution of the different kind of uh, uh, ways of uh, assessing the different groups are in the studies. Now, I think when we look at um, these types of studies, it is important to consider some aspects such as case definition. Uh, I mean, this goes for if you're working in, you know, phase one, phase sorry, phase two, three studies as well. But obviously, it is important to understand exactly what your case definition is. N these are normally um, a set of standardised criteria and help you to identify your cases. And it should be very clear as to what you are using as a case definition so that you can uh, ensure that you are able to pick those cases out appropriately. So the methods that are used to identify a case are extremely important. So if you're looking, for example, at breast cancer, is it mammography or biopsy that you're going to use to determine whether you have a case or not? Because that will make a difference overall. You can't, you, sh you shouldn't be using, you know, either or. You should be very clear exactly what it is that you are using. Also, if you look at boundaries, that's also important too. So again, with the breast cancer case, um, is it that you're using pre-invasive or only invasive tumors? Because again, that will make a difference to what you're seeing and the information that you're collecting. If you have a continuous variable, then you need to ensure that there is a, a cutoff, a cutoff point that is defined so that you can identify as to where your cases are. The unit of analysis is also important. So it could be that, um, again, going back to the breast cancer uh, example, are you referring to a case of breast cancer or just to uh, a malignant tumor in the breast? You know exactly what it is that you are going to say is your unit of analysis. When looking at your population, you also need to be clear 
as to what you are considering your population at risk to be. The study population is the population who could have become cases, and you need to ensure that you have got this population at risk so that you can make the appropriate conclusion. So if, for example, you're looking at cervical cancer as a population, population would be the number of women in that country, but it could, in, oh, sorry, the population could be the number of women in that country, that's population at risk. However, that would also include women who may have had a hysterectomy and then who technically could not get, you know, a cervical cancer, and therefore that will then change your population overall, and that will have an impact on the study results because it's not the exact population at risk. So routine beta is another area I wanted to touch upon. It is extremely important when it comes to pharmacopoeiological studies. And you can see that there are different ways of getting this information. So you can have population-based data, so your census information, your population registries, your civil registration, so that's where your births and deaths are recorded. You can have disease registries, GP records, you know, surveys that all are all available. And also, if you're looking at some of the uh, other exposures, such as education, housing, et cetera, there are those kind of records available too. I think what's important here is that these are routine data. They're not set up to answer any specific research question. So it is, in a way, a, a bit of a, a data dump depending on who's completed that information and how that information has been entered into the database. And there needs to be an understanding of what type of data is included, how it's collected, and how that may change as well over the years so that you know exactly what you're looking at and how that analysis can be, can be done and how it can affect your analysis as well overall. Now, Looking at measure of effect, here we're looking for an association between the exposure and outcome, a certain factor in the outcome, and gives you an idea of the magnitude of the effect of exposure on that outcome. And that's when you compare the occurrence of that outcome in your exposed compared to your non-exposed group. And here what you'll get is a ratio which gives you that strength of association. And you can have a risk ratio, a rate ratio, odds ratio. It depends on the type of study that you've done and the results that you have seen. But the ratio will give you that, um, that, that an, uh, an idea of how strong that association is with the exposure that you're looking at. So if you had, for example, a risk ratio of, say, 10, that would imply that group 1 is 10 times more likely to get the outcome compared to group 2. So you can see there's a, it gives you that strength there. I think it's uh, worthwhile noting that for certain studies, you will use a risk ratio, and for others, an odds ratio will be appropriate. So for a cohort study, you use a risk ratio. For a case control study, you would use the, uh, an odds ratio, just based on issues to do with denominator there. So when we do look and have a strength of association or see this association some way, there are reasons for that association. It could be that there is a true association, so what you're seeing is actually the reality of it. Could be, though, that this is down to random error, chance, and that is where stats plays a big part uh, in ensuring that that can be reviewed and assessed appropriately. And then you have confounding and bias, which we'll come on to next. So if we look at confounding, so confounding is basically that there is an alternative explanation for what you've seen. Now, when you have a confounding factor, this has to be associated with the exposure that you're looking at, and it has to be associated with the outcome as well, but it should not be on the causal pathway. And you can see that here. So you can see that we've got the example outcome of pancreatic cancer. You could be looking at smoking as the exposure. This is the causal pathway. And coffee is a confounder because it is associated with smoking and it is associated with development of pancreatic cancer, but it's not on this pathway. Now, what's important here is that when you do have a confounder, this needs to be addressed within the study. And this can be addressed through either restrictions, so you limit um, who you have in your study. 
matching or randomization. And you can also address this in the analysis by adjusting for different confounders so that you can then uh, take that effect away and have a look at the true effect of your exposure and your pancreatic cancer. Because if you don't take that into consideration, what you will see is that the strength of association will not be correct. It will either be too high or too low. And you do need to take that into consideration to get the right results. So if we look at bias now, so bias is where there is a systematic error in the design and conduct of a study. So it's to do with the study, and it only exists within that study. And it will lead to uh, an error in the estimate of that association between the exposure and the outcome. And importantly, you can't make adjustments at the analysis stage. You have to really understand your populations, how you've uh, included your study groups, how you've measured the outcome to understand where bias could occur within your study. So in descriptive studies, bias will occur when the study population is not representative of the population we want to describe. And in, in analytical studies, bias will occur when the comparison groups are not comparable uh, aside to the exposure and outcome. So there are systematic differences between those two groups that are impacting on your measure of association. So I'm going to touch on the different types of bias. Go to the right slide. So the first one is selection bias. So um, this occurs in descriptive studies if some members of the population are more or less likely to be included than others. So it's not a, a representative sample. So an example is that, say, if you're carrying out a survey on um, alcohol intake, uh, people who have a heavy amount of alcohol intake may be less likely to participate in the survey. And if that's the case, then you're unlikely to see the true kind of level of um, those with alcohol intake within that population. It will be underestimated. In analytical studies, as we've said, uh, selection bias can occur when comparison groups are not comparable. So it's just that systematic differences between the groups. So it could be that uh, assessing uh, pancreatitis as cases and using GP surgery patients as a control. You're going to have inherent differences between the two groups. So in order to minimize selection bias, the study participants should be representative of the target population. And if you should aim for response rates that are as high as possible. However, if there is a difference between response rates, you should have a look at uh, the different response rates in the groups to check whether there are inherent differences between the two groups to look for this uh, selection bias. Now, if we look at the next type of bias, this is information bias. And there are various facets to this. So this usually refers to a bias that um, arises from measurement errors. So the first one is reporting bias. And here we have a recall bias, which occurs when subjects you know, ha who have a specific health outcome report previous exposures with a different degree of accuracy to those who don't have the outcome or when subjects who have experienced a specific exposure then report outcomes in a different way to a different degree of accuracy to those who haven't had that exposure. So an example here would be um, in a case control study where you're looking at risk factors for adult leukemia. So people with leukemia as a case would be more likely to remember that they were exposed to chemicals compared to the control. So they'd be more likely to report that. So um, in, in general, though, people who have been you know, found to have serious diseases may have been asked several times as well about possible exposure. So it stays in their mind, and they're, they're just more, uh, more uh, 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 likely to remember those kind of exposures and report them. Also, if we look at um, uh, observer bias, this can also occur 
with regards to uh, the accuracy of the exposure or the outcome data and where that that is recorded differs between the subjects in the different groups in either the outcome or the exposure groups. So that could be something like say mesothelioma, this is a rare cancer, it may be difficult to diagnose this um, histologically, but if whoever's looking at that diagnosis knows that somebody's been exposed to asbestos, they may be more likely to actually um, say that yes, this is, or diagnose the mesothelioma based on that and knowing that in the background rather than someone who, who has not been exposed to asbestos. And then that will create inherent differences between the groups. Now with interviewer bias, this can occur if the interviewer uh, interprets the responses differently depending on which group uh, the subject has come from. Now I just wanted to touch briefly on misclassification here. Uh, this is related to measurement error and occurs when subjects basically are not allocated to the right group because there's incorrect um, ascertainment of either their exposure or the outcome. So if this is differential, i.e. there are differences between the groups, this will lead to, to bias and it will affect the study re results. So basically you're getting the wrong patients going into, or the wrong subjects going into the wrong group. So where they're a case, they're going into control, or where they're a control, they're going into the case group. And that's down to measurement error. So how do we minimize information bias? Well, we do that through blinding. So you blind either the subjects and the uh, reporter or the in investigator. Use of objective re records will minimize subjectivity. Uh, things are meant to be recorded uh, objectively in, in those types of records. You should try and collect the exposure data as close as possible to the actual exposure to minimize recall bias. The use of standardized questionnaires can also take out some of that subjectivity. And automated measuring devices, is, and the use of this is also important to ensure that the measurement is correct. And of course, calibration across sites is important to ensure that the measurement is, is consistent across all of those sites. Again, if you've been used to doing phase two, three, one, two, three studies, you'll know about all of this, but that's not quite the case in some of the, the people that have been involved in the epidemiological side of things. So I'm just going to talk about the different types of studies now. So the first one is a cross-sectional study. So here you measure the frequency of a particular exposure or outcome in a population, but importantly, this is at a specific point in time. Now this can be descriptive or analytical. If it's descriptive, you will simply describe the frequency of your exposure or outcome in a defined population. And this is just to give you an example you can see here. You know, you've got a prevalence of 45% of smokers. If we look at the analytical side, here you're collecting information on also the outcome, the risk factor, and you can compare the two groups in the exposed with the unexposed. So here the example is if you've got an outcome of, for example, lung cancer, you've got your smokers and non-smokers. These are your non-smokers, these are your smokers. You can see that the prevalence is 45% in uh, your smokers and 32% in your non-smokers. And then you can do uh, statistical analysis behind that. So for cross-sectional studies, though, um, it is important that the uh, study or the sample is representative of the target group and also to take into account generalizability exactly who have you studied and is other results generalizable to the uh, rest of the country or whatever it is that the group that you're interested in. So if, for example, you have smoking in adolescents and you're looking at that and you're only looking in, the, in urban areas, that may not be generalizable to the rest of the country because uh, not all of the country is urban. So the measure of effect in these types of studies are your prevalence ratio or your prevalence difference, the difference between prevalence in the two groups. Odds ratio as well can be used. Um, 
It's important, as we've said before, to collect information on confounding, so you can adjust for that in your analysis. And here we're introduced to reverse causality. So this is where, because you're looking at something at a specific point in time, you cannot say what came first, outcome or exposure. And that can then lead to thinking that, um, you know, okay, in this case we said smoking and lung cancer, but it could be something else, and you cannot say for sure that smoking has led to lung cancer or lung cancer. It could be that lung cancer is associated with smoking some way, the other way around. So the only way that you actually can look at causality is where you have a fixed characteristic in an individual. So where you have, for example, something related to either sex of the patient or blood group, something that can't change, then you can infer causality from that perspective. So looking at bias in these studies, so selection bias can occur if the probability of taking part in the study is related to both the exposure and the outcome. So here it could be that if you're ex looking at alcohol intake and depression, and those with a high alcohol intake and depression are more likely to take part in the su survey, it will bias your results. Information bias may occur if um, there's issues with recall bias because they, they may not remember certain things depending on which group, you know, whether they've got the outcome or not. So if you have, for example, a cross-sectional study looking at risk factors for chronic bronchitis, chronic bronchitis patients may be more likely to recall smoking than those who don't have chronic bronchitis. So looking at the strengths and the weaknesses of these studies, um, these are cheap and easy to perform. They do give a lot of information on burden of disease, and they're often used as a first step kind of to ascertain a potential causal relationship. However, you can only measure prevalence. You can't measure incidence. You can't measure new cases. You can only measure the existing cases in the population. And reverse causality is an issue here. So causally, you cannot say for sure that the exposure has led to the outcome. The next type of study is the cohort study. So here you are looking at a study population that is divided up into an exposure and a non-exposure, or the unexposed, and they are then followed up until you get the outcome of interest. And the two groups are then compared. So here the advantage is that the exposure is measured prior to the outcome. And that allows you to measure incidence and also to give some evidence of causality. So they can be descriptive or analytical. If you have a descriptive study, you will look at um, a, a risk a percentage or rate percentage. If you have an analytical study, you will compare the risk or rate in each group, and you'll get a risk ratio or rate ratio, as we talked about before. And of course, it's important to collect data on confounders so they can be adjusted for in the analysis. Now, if we look at the bias here, so biases here for selection are um, follow-up. If you do get missing follow-ups in these studies, you, and it's different in each group, then that can lead to uh, a systematic difference between the two groups and can lead to selection bias overall. Now, the way that you overcome this is to try and maximize outcome results, try and minimize your loss to follow-up, uh, try and make them not too long so that you've got less, you're less likely to have patients that uh, drop out of the study. And you can also have selection bias if your unexposed group is not correctly selected and um, it's not representative then of uh, where the exposed group could have come from. Observer bias can occur where the, if the accuracy of information that's collected differs between the two groups. And we've talked about this before. This can be avoided by using uh, objective measurements, um, by ensuring that information is uh, collected as soon as possible, you know, after the exposure, and, uh, and, and putting those aspects into place. So if we look at the advantages and disadvantages here, so here the advantages are that you're measuring the exposure before the outcome, so you're not biased by the outcome. You have a clear sequence of events from a time perspective, so you minimize reverse causality. You can, you're more likely to see A leading to B and, and be able to make that um, uh, reference. 
You can provide data also uh, on the time, course of development of the outcome, including late effects as well. And you can look at more than one outcome at once. So, and it's good for rare exposures. Because you're choosing your exposure group, you can find those rare exposures and compare to non-exposures. So it's, it's good for those, those kind of studies. It is, though, uh, they are slow, and they are expensive, and they're not good for rare outcomes. So you can imagine, if you're looking for a rare outcome, you're going to need so many subjects, including or, or potential, yeah, well, so you're going to need a huge cohort to be able to pick out those rare outcomes. You can have historical cohort studies, but you do need then reliable exposure records, because you, you need to go back and look at those. If it's a long study, um, exposure status could change. You could have smokers that become non-smokers, and that can affect your study. If you have differential loss to follow-up, remember we talked about that. If you have follow-up in a loss to follow-up in one group, that's more than the other group. It can change the um, actual uh, um, characteristics of those two groups. And you need to have consistency of diagnostic criteria as well, because that can change as well throughout the study. And then that can have an impact on the uh, analysis and the results that you see in the outcome data. Right, the next study is the case control study. So here, you identify the cases that you want to study, and you look at a representative control group. And then you look at exposure in both of those groups and compare across. Now, it's important that the control group must be representative of the population that produced the cases, but not have that outcome, obviously. So anyone who is in the control group could potentially have been a case, and that is extremely important. Now, if we look at bias in a case control study, selection bias will occur in selecting the cases from the controls. And as I said, it's extremely important that the controls are representative of the population that produces the cases. If they aren't, then this will introduce selection bias. For information bias, this can be a problem uh, because of recall bias, because you've, uh, you've got your cases, they've already developed the outcome, and you've got your controls, and you have to go back and look at the exposure. So that can be a problem if it's not noted down somewhere. People as we said before, maybe more likely to remember if they have the outcome than if they don't have the outcome, if they're a case compared to a control. So you can try and minimize this by using objective records, standardized questionnaires, um, rather than uh, relying on, on people's memory overall. Now, if we look at the advantages and disadvantages, so they're quick and easy to do because you've identified your cases and you look at a control group and then you look back at data that's available. And they're good for rare diseases. Because you're picking out your outcome group, your case group, you can then you know, look at you, you've got a, a, a group of patients with that outcome that you can go to. You don't have to wait for that outcome to develop. They're good for diseases with long latency, again, because you don't have to wait for that outcome to develop. You can go back and look back in time. And you can look at multiple exposures for a single outcome. But there are issues with these studies because uh, selection bias is a problem, particularly with regards to the control group, information bias as well, for the reasons that we've just talked about. Reverse causality is a problem here, again, because from a time perspective, you've got the outcome already and you're looking back in time. Therefore, you cannot say for sure. You haven't got an idea of time course like you do with the cohort studies. And you cannot say for sure that um, the exposure has led to the development of the outcome. It's not good for rare exposures in the same way that cohort studies aren't good for rare outcomes because you would need a huge case group, a new huge control group for the rare exposures. You can overcome this, though, in a nested case control study. And you can't estimate disease incidence or prevalence from these studies because of denominator issues. Right, moving on now, we have the intervention studies. And probably in the farm industry, we're much more used to these kind of studies. And here, you allocate uh, the exposure or the intervention. And you have a control group that receives standard treatment. And you compare that to an intervention group, which is followed over time. And you look for the outcome. So here, uh, importantly, we start to introduce random allocation. This is uh, key 
because this minimizes selection bias and also confounders as well because confounders will also be randomly assigned to each group and therefore should kind of cancel itself out in the analysis. But I think importantly, there are ethical issues here because you can only use these studies for potential benefit. So for example, if you wanted to look at uh, smoking and the effects of smoking, you couldn't allocate someone to, to smoking in a group because that's unethical. Um, Follow-up is also important in these studies and they need to be maximized to avoid the introduction of uh, bias. And again, it should be uh, assured wherever possible that the per person who assigns the outcome diagnoses uh, doesn't know what treatment group the subject is allocated to, again, to avoid bias. So in these studies, we have, although bias is limited, we do have reporter and observer bias, but this can be limited by using a double-blind um, kind of study. Analysis of the results should be on an intent-to-treat basis and not just per protocol. So um, we need to ensure that participants that were excluded on the basis of poor adherence to the study protocol are assessed appropriately. And if you do have negative results, you need to look at sample sizing and, and power. So the advantages of these studies are, they are obviously kind of more the gold standard. You minimize selection bias and confounding and reporting and observer bias. And they do provide an evidence really of a causal relationship between kind of your exposure and outcome. Uh, they are similar to cohort studies and you can look at multiple outcomes and you can look at instance rates at all. But they are long, they're expensive and there are ethical issues associated with them. So the last couple of slides are just on, uh, one is on ecological studies, ecological studies. Um, these look at differences at a group level, and they're probably used more from an epidemiological perspective, looking at, for example, pollution and cancer. They often use routine data, quick cheap, similar to kind of um, a, a case control type study. And often they're used as the first step in uh, the investigation of a causal relationship. And then you would follow that up with other studies. And then you have the case series, which are you know, Im important. They're probably more popular in clinical medicine. That's where cases are presented uh, based on interesting findings. But they're not really used in um, epidemiology. They're probably more used for hypothesis generation. They are quick and cheap because you're just describing a number of cases that you've seen and, and postulating that maybe there, there is something that could be linked between them. They're weak for empirical evidence, and they don't have the comparison group, and the numbers are often small. But again, they're, they're usually used as a first step into then following up with another study or analysis of some kind. So I'm going to end with just the last slide, which hopefully can give you an idea of the four main studies, the case control, cross-sectional, cohort, and interventional studies, and give you an idea of where the benefits and risks risks are with regards to these studies. So you can see that a case control would be good for a rare outcome. It's uh, good for long latency. It's economical and quick to do. But there are issues with bias associated there. So you can kind of use this as a reference uh, when you're looking at a study, when you're looking at a publication, to give you an idea of where the issues may be for those different types of studies. And I'm going to stop there. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? Nope, it doesn't look like any questions are coming through. Do email me, though, if you do have any questions. I'll do my best to answer them. Uh, but thank you very much for attending. <laughs>